impression. To 3.45, we'll have presentations and then panel discussions, followed by we will have um, like 3.45 to 4.15, we'll have presentation from impact entrepreneurs. Uh, then we'll have like a feedback, uh, summarizing, and also like any road mapping for this next step. And uh, later on, 4.25 to 5 p.m., uh, we have till 5 p.m. here for networking. And later, we can always go to Blue Bottle Coffee there and network more. So, yeah, so our keynote speaker today is uh, Mercedes, and she will be starting with her presentation right now. Thank you. So thank you for having me. Um, oh, how do we move on your, how do I switch sides? Uh, just up and down. Yeah. Oh. yeah. All right. I see. All right, so I'm Mercedes Bankston. I am an exited founder, but I'm also involved in venture capital. Um, I've also worked for very large companies on the sustainability front, regardless if it's Cisco, Oracle, NEC, or McGraw-Hill Education. Um, all these big companies are looking for massive amounts of change, particularly within sustainability. Um, but I really focus on fintech and property tech and probably consumer goods. So, I mean, I think most of us know um, the world is pretty broken and there's a lot of crises to solve at this point in time. Um, the pandemic was a massive change, I think, for us. Um, we had the Ukraine war break out. Um, a lot of people are looking at what's going on in various countries with plastics. Obviously, COVID has created a ton of healthcare waste and we have had unprecedented burning within California and Europe. And the problem with that is our planet is literally in trouble and we need solutions for greenhouse um, gases and carbon markets now. And really it is up to us as individuals to make that difference. Um, a large part of like what I do is working with entrepreneurs uh, because they make big impacts. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the companies I've worked with, um, but now venture capital is really investing in entrepreneurs and sustainability is probably the largest market of investment that's going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, but ultimately, really what it comes down to is the users really have to support the entire um, <laughs> system. Ah. So um, I know that like a lot of these problems feel that they're very large, um, but I always love this quote, like, um, if you think you're too small, try sleeping with the mosquito. Anyone who's like dealt with a mosquito in like their tent or in their house, um, they are running around in the middle of the night, just like highly frustrated at like what's going on. Um, so again, let's look at the world from a very high up view. Uh, this company, um, I've met the founder. He is phenomenal. He literally has satellites that are taking pictures of the earth every day. And he can determine when a forest is being burned down within a 24 hour period where people are actually taking out the rainforest illegally. Um, he is tracking and plotting things like farms. Um, and in fact, you know, I asked him what was like the single thing that we could do to like change the trajectory of the earth. And he said, ultimately get rid of cows uh, because cows are the reason that forests are um, reducing um, the carbon. So it's something to think about. Um, he provides reports, obviously, for businesses, for individuals. I would go check them out and read them. It's at planet.com. But when I talk about companies that I've worked with and invested in, um, I feel like fashion is becoming one of their top uh, topics within sustainability. And it's because we're always buying new clothes, new shoes, things of that nature, but we also have a huge returns problem now that we have Amazon, um, you know, constantly shipping things for free. I mean, how often are we returning things? And so there's companies that really hit the market in the past like five years that are making big differences. And there's younger people that are changing the way of like how we purchase, how we rent things. Um, up until five years ago, I wouldn't even have considered like renting a piece of clothing or maybe even buying secondhand clothing. Um, but literally last month, I actually bought something offline um, that was a return and I got it for 50% off. 
And really what that meant to me was like, if I'm willing to buy something, oftentimes it has to do with price, but that's the reason that fast fashion exists is people are buying things based off of price. Um, so how do the, those two worlds intersect? Um, where we are reusing something and we're buying things for a lower price. There's companies like Arrive. Um, Arrive really is a returns company, but they really focus on logistics and transportation. And it's that middle piece that we often don't think about as consumers that um, cause like something at the very end of the supply chain to be expensive or cheap. They are taking things out of landfills literally um, by taking your return shipments, various brand shipments. Um, and they're definitely a company that is worth looking at. They just recently received, I think, 16 million in funding. Um, there's a gentleman that is really hitting the men's market of uh, rentals and he's doing really well. He can't even keep up with his supply chain. It's called Rent With Thread. He's very new to the market. Um, and it's interesting to me because men are starting to look at this versus just like women. And that is a very big change, I think, in our trajectory and particularly in the past year. And new companies have come out within fashion like Biofluff. They're a plant-based fur company, um, particularly in San Francisco where more people have costume fur coats than anything else. Like almost everyone in San Francisco is part of this interesting fur crowd. Um, this company is taking off and it's a lot of fun. And then last of all, the one that I wanted to really speak about, and he's making a huge impact, but his company is a, uh, deals with tanneries and leather tanneries, your shoes, your coats, things like that produce so many emissions within their heat, the water waste and Qualys actually reduces this by 70%. Um, as a result, there's a lot of manufacturers in Europe that just recently started moving towards his company solely because they have to meet the carbon um, credits uh, required by the European government. And it's just a really big step um, for the change of fashion, right, to make it a little bit more sustainable. I also do a lot with battery and heat. Um, so some of these are like property tax, but one of my favorite companies to talk about from a sustainability standpoint is Radiflis. They um, actually recycle batteries on site. And so when we talk about all the cars that have batteries and these stacking up at car manufacturers or um, at the dealership because they're changing the batteries out, where does it go? And they're a hazmat waste. But the interesting thing about a battery is it's 100% recyclable. And they literally have a truck that goes on site, they pick it up, so and then they recycle it right then and there, and they melt down the metals um, and sell it from that point. And why is this important? Because they're taking out what used to happen where like that hazardous material would move around the country and it eventually oftentimes would end up in a landfill. Um, but they're really going to like the source of like where it's no longer of use and they're melting it down. Um, the, another company that's kind of come up is New Watts. Um, they're in the heat segment. Um, in manufacturing, this is becoming really important. So particularly in like blockchain manufacturing, um, they give off lots of heat. Um, data centers are very heavy. The electricity bills are really high. And if you can contain that heat and reuse it, um, it's going to reduce uh, carbon emissions as well as greenhouse gases. And then the food industry really is changing um, <laughs> on so many levels. Um, but one of the favorite companies I've been dealing with for about 10 years is called Oddbox. They're out of the UK. Um, they take ugly vegetables. Uh, that people wouldn't buy in a grocery store and they sell them like basically to your door. Um, they got started basically with just moms in the UK uh, that essentially wanted lower cost vegetables um, for a fraction of the price and wanted something healthy for their family. Again, like price continues to be the methodology in which like people buy. So if we can reduce, you know, the cost of electricity, or you know the cost of clothing, people will buy secondhand items um, moving forward. 
But ultimately, like, why do these companies exist? It's the first time in history that governments are creating regulations faster than people. Um, this is unprecedented. And it's really interesting because governments are realizing like what this is doing to our health, what it's doing to our land. And so they're making some massive changes. And this is exactly why the European Union passed a law last year um, around greenhouse gases and carbon markets and sustainability. So as a UK company or a European company, you are required by law to tell the government every April, like how you are changing sustainability and what that impact means for your company. And there's so many ways to like change your company. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But when we talk about like progressive countries that are really like changing the game in the carbon markets, I listed them here. It's Costa Rica, Ghana, and Cambodia. They really are going after reforestation um, and the planting obviously of plants. Um, but then we look at our biggest offenders. Um, obviously it's China, the United States, India, and Russia. And it's just, it's really interesting to see like how that correlates to um, really investment. <laughs> uh, the strange thing too is like Canada is very involved. They passed a greenhouse emissions law last, I believe last month or last year. Um, as a result, companies are also being held to accountability, but Canada also is working with other countries around the world in effort to like change things. So the sustainable investment outlook, it's going to grow so much in the next 20 years. It is expected to grow tenfold, if not more. Um, the biggest players in the market happen to be Europe. Um, what I find fascinating about that is the people who are mostly interested in investment into sustainability actually are not the ones creating the problems. And so there is a big delta and a big divide that we have to look at. And the world really needs to reevaluate um, the products that we give people access to and how to change that moving forward. So be part of the change. You have to change too. Um, there's a lot of things that I put on this um, from an individual standpoint. Um, there's a company called makesoil.org. Their focus is for people to start making soil at home by using compost. Um, before I came across this company, I didn't realize that soil is actually depleting each year. Um, and so it is really important to compost it and make and create more soil. Um, there's a lot of tree planting partnerships. They're a dime a dozen. The question is, is like how to get involved with one and how to find a reputable one. Um, I know when I was living in the UK, it always felt like when I purchased an item or purchased an airplane ticket, I could always buy carbon credits. And then I could go back and research like exactly where that was and what happened to like that tree that was planted. That is not something that I see in the United States. And it's something that definitely has to change. Um, the attitudes, I think, as consumers that we have in the United States versus the ones in Europe are very different on sustainability. Um, greenhouse gases, obviously, you know, it, just reducing um, your thermostats, whether it's in your office, in a corporate location, um, looking at solar as an alternative, that isn't always the best thing to do, but you can absolutely do that in places like California, um, Utah, many places around the United States. And then I think over the pandemic, you know, we had unprecedented bikes like being purchased. Um, I walk and bike many places. I don't get in my car that often. And it's really not that hard to do. Um, it's healthy. Like just get outside and like do something else and understand where your supply chain is coming from. Um, so often I'm going to like the grocery store and I'll find an avocado and find it's from Guatemala. And there's no reason to buy something that has commuted so far in California when we have tons of avocados in our backyard. Um, so again, like understand that supply chain, understand the amount of travel, the amount of gas that it took and follow it along the way. So the question is, is can you drive the change of a mosquito? Um, a lot of this is like buying local in a farmer's market, putting pressure for like big corporations to do the same, um, particularly if they have kitchens like on site. And buy for zero waste. Um, I read a home blog many years ago that was called the Zero Waste Home. And that really changed like how I looked at the world. And so 
if I purchased items knowing that I'd never throw them away, um, that really reduced like what I was, um, well, actually throwing away, but like how I looked at like my entire uh, view of the world. I started looking into B Corp companies. Um, these are phenomenal resources within the US. Um, and the reason for that is that they put money back into um, what they believe is good. Um, whether that's, uh, well, basically e any ESG component um, and they publish those. So go and look for them for inspiration. And you'll notice companies like Patagonia, they have like used clothing that you can buy online, um, but they also publish like why they're just harmful for the environment at the end of the year. And I always say like, speak to your lawmaker in person. The reason for this is you can make a phone call and you can email, but nothing like drives change than like showing up at a government office and saying like, hey, we don't want styrofoam like to be sold or plastic utensils to be sold like in our jurisdiction. They do listen in person. Um, so the call for action for change, you know, particularly within a corporation is it really starts with us as an individual. And we have to look at industries like the hospitality industry, um, the cruise line industry, the airline industry, they've been doing so much change in the past like couple of years just within sustainability. That is the quick way to go and say like, geez, like if I'm going to emulate something, let me just emulate something that has actually worked. Um, and then if you have board members, hire a temporary board member for sustainability, have them do a ton of research, have them make policies for change, have them come up with ideas. Um, other board members simply don't have time to do this, but it really will change like the needle in a big way. And then again, look at the purchase is in the travel cost and the ongoing maintenance. Um, you know, I know a lot of big corporations do travel a lot. I always tell my employees that they have to travel for five days um, and all five days have to be like booked back to back with like very useful meetings instead of like the days in which someone would fly out just for a two day meeting. Um, it's just not worth it, right? Like those greenhouse gases are growing and any way that you can decrease the impact and decrease your accountability um, makes a big change. And obviously also ask the help from um, alternatives. You know, the public is always talking and they're willing to like tell you like, how can you change your company? How can you change you? Um, it's not always going to work, but it's definitely worth to consider the alternatives. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was amazing. We got to learn a lot. <laughs> so I have a question. So the companies that you mentioned, which were like case studies, so are you all uh, measuring the carbon emissions and impact? A lot of them do. Yeah. So particularly um, the manufacturers are measuring if companies that I've invested in, it definitely know that they're reducing, um, say, water. Um, so Qualys is a great example. He's reducing 70 percent water in almost every manufacturer in a tan rate. So while you were investing, was it a kind of criteria? <laughs> No, but it was, I recognize the reason for the company, right? It wasn't the criteria, but if you can see like a big change, like why wouldn't you like move forward with that? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and any questions? We are a small group. Do you think we should just have a round of introduction so that we all yeah. know <laughs> each other? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so my name is Harsha, I'm representing the International Institute for CSR and we organize sustainability dialogue on a monthly basis for business networking and all exchange of knowledge. And we pick up different topics uh, in and aligned to uh, sustainable development. Thank you. Okay, thanks for this. I'm Michelle. Um, so my question now, uh, <laughs> I'm in uh, AI and um, most of the day I was at Meta. Uh, and the AI research group. I had left Meta a few months ago to work on uh, climate change. Uh, so at the moment, uh, in the ideation phase, we're figuring out to start something which applies AI to climate change. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> uh, 
so I'm Karen Hardy. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at uh, Blockchain Laboratories. We're a startup and we are focusing on um, environmental and societal experiences around Web3 technology. Hi, Megan. Uh, my background is um, construction and sustainability. I'm interested in upgrading my material and energy. My name is Ajay. I my background is in climate science, carbon accounting. Been doing for 15 years. I'm the founder and CEO of Green Swap. We're an AI company. We calculate the carbon emissions of individual barcodes for a supermarket at scale. So all of their products in real time. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm a fulfillment. I'm the postdoctoral researcher. I did my PhD in um, about small medium sized companies, their international operations, and their social and environmental responsibility. So it's more in the academic side of that. Hi, everyone. I'm Anand, and I'm working for a high tech company in their supply chain. So it's pretty complex and really working towards decarbonizing their supply chain. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We have uh, five people online. Do you think uh, we can ask them also to introduce? Uh, yeah, definitely. And uh, then Narayan has a presentation to give. So, sure. Um, uh, Narayan, would you like to introduce yourself and? Um, yeah, let's finish the introduction. Let's finish yeah. the other one, other people. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, uh, hi, folks. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's pretty early in the morning for me here in Bombay in India. And um, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, I um, um, spent about 15 years in the banking and finance industry. Uh, I was co-founder of a small bank and uh, decided that my calling was in the area of sustainability. Uh, took early retirement in December and since January, uh, less than a month now, I have, am uh, part of uh, an organization called Gaviva, which is a B2B SaaS tech platform for ESG lifecycle management and uh, very excited to start this new journey and uh, look, looking forward to making a difference uh, like Mercedes uh, said a little while ago, every small thing matters. So I'm hoping that I'll I'll be one small uh, contribution towards sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Um, would that and yeah, yeah, uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Um, calling in from uh, Folsom, uh, just uh, off the Sierra foothills near Sacramento. Glad to uh, be here with everyone. Um, former active entrepreneur, if I were to use only four words to um, open, used to spend uh, six years of research in energy, environmental, economics, and policy back in the knots, and spent most of the 2010s co-founding uh, startups and usually um, around some social or environmental uh, mission, uh, often involving emerging technologies like uh, machine learning and uh, blockchains. More recently, towards the end of the previous decade, uh, gradually shifted over to the impact from that side of things, uh, given that the truth is, given how much wealth, especially financial wealth, there's in the world, uh, 500 trillion last count, you don't really need to try to convince anyone, you don't need to convince anyone to uh, throw money at these problems like sending global goals, but rather create uh, robust pipelines of uh, bankable projects on those that can actually attract that. So speaking of that, um, right now, I am currently a chief uh, partnerships officer with a group called Innovo Net Zero Limited. Uh, we scale a wide range of profitable clean technologies globally with the mission of having CO2 emissions profitably by 2030. And the flagship that we're going to be I'm going to be presenting on uh, later is um, using algae, so algal photobioreactors, so biorefineries that can be co-located on industrial sites. So think, uh, for those of you familiar with the East Bay, think of getting all of that heavy industry, the cement plants, steel, oil refineries, petrochemical plants, get all of those to zero emission and the same time uh, generating proper outputs like biofertilizer that just throw soil, as um, was mentioned earlier, 
efficient animal feed, so you don't have to compete for uh, cropland for uh, food. And uh, omega-3, uh, that involves, that eliminates the need to have to harvest krill for extracting that. So um, we'll hear more about that uh, later. Again, happy to be here. Heather? Thank you, and um, we have a young boy, right? Yep, you got Thank it. Thank you. Um, my name is Heather Tanner. I, uh, I'm i in biotech right now. I'm just uh, just curious, um, trying to see how I can get my foot in the door a little further. Thank you. Thank you. So here, this is I'm Anurupa Sharma. I am currently uh, working on my AI machine learning based startup. So it's a very initial space. And um, I used to work with Intel and Habana Labs as an heading AI and machine learning and managing AI products. And currently I'm very interested in sustainability where I met Harsha and what we are working together on a couple of things. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nara, would you like to start your presentation? Sure. Oh. So... You can share the presentation if you want. I think we are a small group okay. here. It should be fine. <laughs> okay, I hope you can see the screen. Sorry about the time. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to finish it up soon. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. So, yeah, like I mentioned in the intro, I uh, am part of Gaviva. I am a co-founder and chief growth officer. And we believe that we are on a mission to simplify ESG digitally. Um, ESG is increasingly, uh, you know, getting to be known as being responsible in your business activities. It's, uh, it's essentially responsible business. Um, uh, it's needless to say that uh, uh, ESG aspects have been um, considered to be among the top risks uh, for global corporates. Um, there's a chart on the right, uh, which uh, which is from the WF uh, Global Risk Report, uh, and you can see that a lot of the risks that are uh, that are mentioned out there, and especially the higher ones, are all related to E, S, and G. Uh, in, and increasingly, uh, there are a lot of mandatory reporting requirements, and rightly so, uh, for action um, from corporates uh, to reduce GHG. Uh, and uh, very recently, California has taken the lead uh, with uh, two Senate bills, 253 and 261. And uh, the SEC is soon uh, to, to be uh, coming out with their climate disclosure rules, um, and these will become applicable from the following year. Uh, there are a lot of stakeholder expectations, uh, not just investors or shareholders, but increasingly uh, from local, uh, from from your customers and local communities. And for corporates, there is always the uh, the positive angle to give back to society by being a catalyst for community development. And all these can be achieved. Uh, alongside generating profits, uh, uh, investing in ESG or or, or uh, undertaking ESG activities does not mean uh, it is an, an increase in cost or reduction in profit. Uh, on the contrary, there have been enough studies to show that um, uh, it can uh, you know uh, save cost and increase revenue. But of course, yeah, implementing an ESG program is not easy. Uh, and for it to be successful, it has to be objective, measurable, sorry, and outcome-based. There are a lot of challenges, and we believe we have a, a solution for each of them. Um, the first challenge is on data availability, uh, simply because this is an extremely new greenfield area, and uh, the kind of data that's required was never required to be captured earlier. And therefore, most corporates uh, struggle to find those data points and you know, collate them. Um, uh, you know, we have a practical example in India. We uh, There's an equivalent uh, called BRSR, which is the Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report. 
which the top thousand companies by market cap as of a particular year have to report on the following year. And uh, the uh, it's a very comprehensive report. It's it's based on the GRI, and uh, but every uh, corporate had to uh, report on it, including the one that I represented last year. It was a big struggle. Um, so what? Uh, uh, simply because uh, in many cases data is not available, so you will have to make some assumptions, and in some cases it's lying in you know 10, 20 different systems. Um, our solution is API enabled, so it can integrate with other systems and pick those data points where available. Uh, a bigger issue is one of uh, uh, skill set availability. Uh, corporates, uh, again, because uh, it's a greenfield area, uh, do not have enough resources uh, that are aware of what ESG is, or um, they are not equipped, and they probably don't have the bandwidth. Uh, and here, uh, while we are a SaaS tech platform. We also have a ESG, uh, an ESG advisory to help corporates uh, wade through these uh, requirements. Uh, there are multiple frameworks and parameters and our solution uh, is based on global standards. It takes into account every global standard that is uh, that is that has been released and is uh, localized for that country for reporting. Uh, most of the uh, requirements for mandatory reporting uh, are very prescriptive, uh, a lot of subjective answers, and uh, we have an AI-driven uh, reporting uh, uh, technology which helps you to collate all these uh, uh, subjective answers and, 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 and come up with a more cogent, simplified response. And last but not the least, it's uh, uh, like we said, for it for a program to be successful, it has to be measurable and outcome based. And and, and our platform uh, has real time dashboards to help you measure and track. Because uh, if you don't measure, uh, then there is no point to what you're doing, right? So one has to continue to uh, to keep track of the progress. And uh, this uh, real time dashboards uh, with real time GHG calculators helps you. Uh, or helps you know exactly where you are in your ESG journey and what else needs to be done. So uh, um, the we call this a lifecycle manager because it's an end-to-end -end, uh, solution. And uh, this is something we uh, have come across as uh, a requirement uh, from enterprises, as opposed to having multiple point solutions that then have to be you know worked on to collate data. So this is a, a, a all-in-one box if you will and we start with the seven step process starting with the materiality assessment uh, leading to a baselining leading to defining the parameters uh, coming out of the gap analysis uh, drawing the strategic roadmap and and translating them to actionables which you know through a work through the workflow system in the in a, a workflow in the system can uh, help you track where you are and finally report on it including the regulatory report which is generated at the click of a button um, so uh, just a flavor of the system, you can see uh, three screenshots, one on the assessment dashboard and then on the materiality assessment and also the uh, workflow pending module. So why Gaviva? Uh, this is a, like I mentioned a couple of times, a uh, platform driven approach. Um, so it's secure, scalable and uh, ensures enterprise-wide coverage. So no, it's not just a system sitting in the uh, corporate office where data entry is to be done. It is extended to the entire enterprise across all locations where the data is available or needs to be punched in if required. Um, Real-time measurement and monitoring and all, all your ESG data is uh, thereafter sits in one platform. Obviously it is collected in multiple different sources but finally, uh, you know, uh, all the data comes and sits in one platform for you to be able to track your progress. Um, we have global subject, but we have in-house uh, uh, SMEs uh, uh, who are certified in ESG and who can help, uh, you know, corporates along the way. And they also uh, uh, carry a lot of practical business experience. So this combination really comes into play uh, you know, in helping corporates uh, in 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 wading through this journey, and I already said it's based on all the global standards, and we are actually assignment driven. We uh, sorry, we are not assignment driven. We are we we will be a fellow traveler in this journey, and uh, make sure that 
uh, your success is what will determine our success. Um, outcome and impact oriented approach, and I already mentioned it's an end to end ecosystem of solutions and services. So we uh, believe in partnering for success. And our goal is to enable measurable outcomes for purpose driven, responsible enterprises. And of course, um, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, uh, our website is gaviva.com. And uh, any inquiries can go to sales at gaviva.com. And thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, this is Narayan. Do you all also have carbon uh, emission measurement in your system now? Or are you planning? Yes, we. No, we do. We have real-time calculators. So, uh, um, you know, any, any anything that you put, whether it's electricity or uh, gas or whatever, uh, uh, we have those calculators and they are based on stand, uh, global standards. So, um, uh, it will translate and tell you what your uh, footprint is, what your energy intensity is and, and, and the like. And it, they're all real-time calculators. Yeah, it's a great presentation, Brian. Um, so besides carbon, what other ESG metrics uh, do you guys are able to touch on? Sorry, it's not clear. If that question is for me, I'm not able to hear. So besides carbon, what are the other ESG metrics that you all are encompassing? Everything, uh, uh, without exception, whatever is re required. If uh, if you have to report on GRI. Every single parameter in GRI uh, is, is captured. If you have, uh, in India, it's uh, B, uh, BRSR. Uh, in Europe, now it's ESRS. Uh, so our system calculates, uh, I mean, is takes, takes into account every single parameter that you have to report on for E, S, and G. It's not just carbon. It's every single aspect, every parameter of E, S, and G. So in, 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 in S, you uh, from the HR system, you'll have the DEI matrix. In G, uh, uh, from uh, uh, you know about your board composition, your board meetings. Uh, I'm just giving you a few examples. Uh, so it, it it is entirely comprehensive. There is not a single parameter of E, S, or G that's left out. Thank you, thank you so very much, uh, Nara, for joining us. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. Thank you. It was very uh, nice. And uh, I think Mayanak is already there. So, Mayanak, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, would you like, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, would you like to switch on the camera? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, thank you for joining us. Uh, I wanted to check if you would like to give any presentation or talk on uh, carbon markets. Uh, well, I'm running from one thing to the other. So at the top of my mind, I do not have much to share today, but I don't have anything prepared either. So uh, maybe I'm open to discussing uh, aspects uh, of uh, carbon markets or carbon trading related to uh, the sector, specifically the oil and gas sector, which I have uh, been working on lately. In, yeah, I think we can start with the um, um, in introduction. Case, I have okay. a short presentation, and then Mainak would be lovely if you could, uh, okay. uh, if you could tell me more about this, because um, yeah. So I know most of us are new in this space and we are just uh, trying to understand uh, the space of uh, carbon markets. The reason why I prepared this was from a layman point of view. If you don't know anything about carbon markets, then this is for you. Because even I did not know much. And how do you get things started in this space? So where did it all start from? It all started from Kyoto Protocol. In 2005, 
uh, Article 6 of Kyoto Protocol came up with uh, carbon credits emission and carbon markets, which was taken over by Paris Climate Agreement, and it is taken, it, it's just ongoing right now. Some of the key players in this uh, are Reed. Uh, Reed uh, actually works for the forest conservation. Uh, Vera. Vera has a registry. Uh, a common registry wherein uh, wherever if you have carbon credits, you can register out there and uh, it is verified and validated by them. Then gold standards, which was introduced by Worldwide uh, Fund for Nature in 20, uh, 2003. These are some of the international standards that I'm mentioning. So uh, something that intrigued me was what is carbon credit life cycle? How, how, do, how does it how do we create it? How do you issue it? And what is the entire system for that? Uh, so if, if I have to introduce a carbon credit and uh, I have to get it listed, how do I go about it? First is as a company, I will go on a project site, say in Ghana, and I'll identify, okay, this is my uh, uh, forest, either forest or uh, like Tesla is doing. Uh, they have the automobile industry and they are conserving energy. So that's one. Every car is a project for them. So um, uh, the transport of the car, if you would have a normal fuel car vis-a-vis, -vis, if you have an electric car, uh, what is uh, the energy consumption and where am I saving? That's one aspect. Or if you have forest then you have to get it validated. Okay, okay this is an actual project. Uh, there is, it's no hunky-dory project. So validation uh, is done and verified. Project validation, or there apart from validation, what is the next stage? Uh, there are different kind of rating systems which have been introduced over here. B zeros, alphabetical scale is there. Selvera's A to D scale is there. So on the basis of what rating your carbon credit is having, will your valuation be? Uh, who issues the carbon credit? Okay, fine. I have identified the, uh, the, for, the, the credit that I can get from the forest or credit that I can get from the automobile. Now I need to register it. There are different registries out there, as I mentioned, where is there, gold standard is there, and each one has its uh, own way of uh, registry. Uh, where you are registering your carbon credit, uh, that will also define what is the money that you can drive from it when it comes to the financial terms. Now, after you have a credit, you need to exchange in order to make money out of it. So uh, carbon trade exchange, expansive to corn, air carbon exchange, climate impact, X, uh, Viridios, AI. These are some of the popular uh, carbon trading exchanges uh, in the market. Now, this is something new that has come. Uh, why has carbon credit insurance come? Because there was greenwashing. <laughs> Because uh, people were put behind the bar in Taiwan for fraud for issuing fraudulent carbon credits, uh, because uh, in uh, London, twelve com sixteen companies were shut down because they were issuing false carbon credits. So there comes carbon credit insurance, and who gave who started it? A uh, company called Harden, based out of Germany, introduced this in two thousand twenty-two. And uh, this is in order to increase the trust in the vol voluntary carbon markets. And they built this uh, in association with Respira International, a carbon finance business, and Nefila Capital Investment Manager. Uh, some of the other popular companies, especially in the UK, uh, in, in US, are Oka, Kita, Atradius, and others. So this is a new market which has come up, carbon credit insurance, and uh, there is a lot that could be done over here. Um, Oka recently raised seven billion dollars for carbon credit insurance. Uh, yeah. Uh, although this is uh, there is a way. Uh, in um, in the U.S. Um, when it comes to California, only California has cap and trade uh, introduced. But other parts of U.S. there is nothing. But there are still controversies. One, it's an unregulated voluntary carbon market. Greenwashing cases are high. 
uh, in California, the mayor has uh, come up with uh, some laws and regulations of penalties, but uh, other states, there is nothing as such right now. Uh, cap and trade of carbon credits, uh, there, are, there are pros, there are cons. Uh, um, what happens is if, if you are producing a lot of uh, products, and then and polluting and if you buy then there could be a overproduction of carbon emission and you are just offsetting it so there is a, a controversy on the cap and trade of carbon credits um many a times uh, the project uh, which you are talking about it does it already exists for example a uh, forest has to be is already in a um, uh, safe zone and no one has to touch it but still on that forest also carbon credits are being issued which is uh, not uh, right and there has been a challenge and uh, we've already seen the other so uh, this is one of the case studies of tesla automobile uh, by the way tesla carbon credit revenue was uh, 1.46 billion uh, in 2020-22, which is 3% of its total revenue. Um, now, uh, if, from a layman term, how would it look like? A normal car, if you look at the first uh, diagram out there, a normal car uh, emission is 130 grams uh, carbon dioxide per kilometer in 2015 to 2019. Vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Tesla will be far lower. And that's how they get their carbon credit. That uh, okay, I am my car is emitting less, ninety five grams per kilo, uh, uh, grams uh, carbon dioxide per kilometer. So that's where the Tesla gets it, and then it, then it uh, gets it registered on Vera or any other carbon uh, registry form, and that's where they will go ahead and then um, put it for um, uh, on the carbon trade exchanges. Uh, which I mentioned uh, earlier. Now, following Tesla, other companies have followed the trend and are uh, looking forward to end the gas and car sales. So uh, they are trying to monetize uh, their products by reducing the carbon emissions. So that is a case study, food, food for thought. Well, how can individuals also trade in carbon? No, we are also conserving carbon emissions uh, when, when we are offsetting it by taking long flights and then they ask us to pay X money <laughs> and offset it. So we also have good karma. So even we should have some carbon credit. Many of us are traveling by uh, public uh, bus. So how, how can we do that? Then ways to control greenwashing beyond regulation. So I, we understand there are a lot of regulations, but how can we as uh, individuals and shareholders and consumers uh, find ways? And can there be centralized measure, measurement system of carbon emissions and credits uh, with universal registry? Because right now, what is there? There are so many different registries. Gold standard is there, Vera is there. Subsequently, other ones may also come up. Uh, but uh, who controls them? And there is no centralized uh, uh, agency. So negations would be high, redundancy would be high, and the, the tracking of each registry is difficult because one carbon credit on one registry could be on the other registry also. So duplication of efforts could be there. So this is the food for thought. Um, I'm representing IICSR. Uh, we are uh, in this business since 2010. We are into capacity building and um, we are trained more than 10,000 corporates. We are working to expand in the US. Uh, we have upcoming workshops in uh, February. One is Certified Carbon Markets and GSG Accounting Practitioner and a Certified ESG Framework Developer in the month of March. And if you all are interested, we have discount coupon Sustainability Dialogues of 20%. And that's my short presentation. I hope it was helpful for people who don't know anything about this. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. In the value chain of right a carbon credit, right? There are multiple stakeholders. Yeah. Right? The registry is one of them, the exchange is one of them, uh, the project developer is one of them, and so on and so forth. There are multiple people in this chain. What is the difference between the registry and an exchange? Right? I didn't even know the exchange was separate. I thought the registry was the exchange because I have gone to those registries and bought it for my company. So exchange is where the tradings happen. You can get your carbon credit validation, verification, everything on the registry. But on exchange is where you can trade. That's 
far as I understand, the, the company that validates it or the organization that validates it is actually separate. It's not the registry company, right? The validation organization is different, right? They validate it. They're yeah. auditors, basically. The people that actually go to the forest and like yeah, they are different. audit and, and make sure that the emissions reductions are happening, which is basically what we found out last year, that 90% of all of them were fake, right? It was in the Guardian article, which first came out. Yeah. So everything is fake, basically. In reality, right? 90% of all of the carbon emissions never happen. Um, but I'm just wondering, what what's the point of the exchange itself? Is, isn't the registry the exchange? Because you can buy and sell on the registry. Uh, registry would be if you have a carbon credit, you need to register at least one and at one location. Uh, and that will determine the value of your carbon credit. Exchange is where that value will be traded, like a stock market, stock exchange. A stock exchange is different. A SEBI is different vis-a-vis -vis a national stock exchange or Bombay stock exchange is different. SEBI is where all the companies need to be registered. Securities and Exchange Board. So I don't know what is the what is the authority over here. Yeah, that's where all all of them would be registered. Uh, but uh, when uh, stock exchanges, then the NYSEs, the LSEs, these are stock exchanges. So over there you can uh, trade, speculate, trade. That's where the traders come into picture. So that's where these guys have sold uh, uh, their credits. And you spoke about cap and trade. As mm. far as I understand, there's a government cap and, cap and trade system that exists in the world. Right? It's not just in California. It's in California. Right? Countries trade with each other. Only. Others are uh, getting in there. Cap and trade is a law only in California uh, for the industries over here. Exactly. There's this cap. But yeah. at the country level, it exists already in the world. At the country level, at the country level it exists, right? only at the, at the in the private sector, it's voluntary. It's not yeah. like voluntary carbon market. Ours is like there and gold standard as a leading organization of yeah. BCI, right? But for the voluntary carbon market, sure, like if there is no like framework and there, there's no governmental. Um, yeah, you're right. You know, so structure. every country has its own cap and trade already in place, but. Uh, apart from in the country which state is doing so in this this country the Californian state is doing uh, the, in our country there is nothing like that yeah in India there is no no such uh, regulation I was just wondering in the absence of like the voluntary carbon market actually causing emissions reductions what is the actual alternative like there is no there's no other way out now right um, now that we have found out that these emissions reductions aren't actually happening in the voluntary carbon market because of, you know, basically lying. Um, what is the actual alternative to carbon market? The existing carbon markets don't function. Yeah, so I think it's not, it's not the market which is the problem, it's the supply of the goods, right? It is all the problem and supply. So what is, it turns out that a lot of the nature-based solutions, they were all made up, right? Yeah. Like the, Forest itself. <clears throat> so then now, what's getting more popularity is the direct air capture exactly. um, or the sequestration into the ground. Exactly. Now, people look at now that's you can verify that's in there, it's not coming out. Um, and so those are the things which I'm seeing, I think, you know, getting traction and people are not buying the nature based ones as much. I, I would argue that the challenge has been around the process. Process has been manual and prone to error. The opportunity around nature based carbon is still there. There's opportunity to use technology to really get it accurate. And that, that's where I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. how blockchain, how weird it is that you think, well, blockchain is not carbon neutral. How can it be? But there are blockchains that are carbon neutral. And as a result of that, you're getting much more transparency. You're, you're avoiding that that those fraudulent credits um, because of the nature of, of, of the way that 
blockchain works from a permanent standpoint. But somebody still has to put data into it. I'd argue that more than the process, it's the intention and the priority of the people putting the data in. Because if the data put in is wrong, that becomes permanent. The wrong data becomes permanent on the blockchain. Yeah. And, and the people putting it in now are mostly in the developing countries where climate change is simply not a priority. It's just not like they couldn't care less. I'm from a developing country. Like I've spoken to many companies that I sell to supermarkets and like you know retailers. It's just not a priority. And if you go to such countries where you know since the labor is cheaper and we're asking them to actually reduce carbon because we don't want to spend our labor, you know, if you ask them to do it, they're all lying now because they're like this is an easy way to get money. Right. But they don't actually care about climate change. Yeah. That's the real well, problem, actually. But yeah. they're also being affected by climate change. Right, right. But, but and but secondly, there there is a need for education, right? Yeah. Because we we haven't cared over the years to just chop down a tree, right? A tree chopping down a tree is being it's more valuable to chop down a tree than to preserve a tree. And and that's okay. where education needs to come in, where where you take the global south and you educate around what the value is and you make that valuable and you give that money to those people and those communities who are taking care of the trees and sequestering carbon. Okay, in the best interest of time, we'll just have final words by Mainak and then yeah, back on to Yeah. Uh, Mainak, do you have any final words for us on uh, the presentations on carbon credits and markets and everything? Yeah, uh, thank you, Harsha. Uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Mainak Mukherjee, and I'm a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, so recently, I gave a, I had a session with Harsha where we were talking about life cycle assessments and um, carbon credits. Uh, the fact is that since I'm working in a sector which is one, considered one of the highest emitting and hard to abet sector, more than I think around 10 to 15% of the global emissions arise from just uh, you know upstream exploration activities of oil and gas. So essentially it's uh, one of those sectors which is which is uh, you know intensely complex in the way it operates and the way it emits whether it's carbon dioxide and one of the major gases that we deem uh, to be, uh, you know, a future a potential threat is methane, right? So a lot of work is going into methane emissions and understanding how methane can be accounted for. And I think the next decade goes to a, a lot of attention goes to methane emissions and accounting for it. Uh, there are dedicated programs uh, across the globe which are doing a lot of methane studies, whether it's aerial studies, drone studies, or even satellite-based studies to account for methane emissions, whether it's originating from the oil and gas sector or from the landfill sectors. Uh, so I'm just kind of wrapping it up with a small uh, thoughts about how the oil and gas companies are foreseeing the carbon credit systems. Uh, as I mentioned before, that it's very difficult for these operating companies to you know, enable themselves or make themselves eligible to trade these kinds of stuff because it's already emitting so much. But if you see uh, World Bank's report, a lot of emphasis, someone just mentioned about nature-based solutions. So these companies are now redirecting their approach into uh, doing a lot of, or essentially undertaking a lot of nature-based solution companies. In fact, if you, if you read report from Food McKenzie, they mentioned that BP and Shell acquired a huge number of NBA solution, NBA solution and companies in 2020 so that they can offset their emissions and somehow the other, you know, get those credits done. Uh, it's not so easy, and even companies like you know, you know, Total Energies, ENI, they have Chevron, they have all partnered with a number of project developers across uh, across the board to generate carbon offsets through forestry projects itself. So uh, this this particular sector is pretty disorganized at this point of time. I would say a lot of work needs to be done, and I think. Uh, if we have to cover all the scopes of emissions, which essentially gets into your entire accounting uh, system, uh, I don't see a simplified solution right away. It has to be done the strategically in a periodic manner, step by step. So we're working towards that. Uh, with this, I would like to yeah end my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maina, for joining us.
um shall uh, uh, there are snacks over there so in case if you all want to have uh some drinks and some samosas feel free yeah, to we can have something in yeah and uh, i would like to invite the next uh speaker kate karen, uh, karen please join us uh, for um, uh, she would be presenting on blockchain technologies and that means thank you Maina, for joining I'm just uh, putting up your presentation, which was here. It's a verification, you know, it's that like final step. Yeah. And like, I've always thought that to be like, yeah, like we buy a carbon credit, this is actually going well. Yeah. So I've always been really focused on like what I can do and the technology is really implemented that actually do what it's doing. Yeah. Okay. I think that would be about like an any natural, like it's a natural drive, or if it's not a drive, you like you mentioned, if there's a scare yeah, capture, totally. if somebody needs to verify. Oh, you want to? So that would be probably a bottleneck where yeah. these insurances and all these different companies that are coming in to try and verify if it's actually happening or not. But it, it's more trust and more. Than a human saying sure, but it was like uh, there's still that you know that not many people are going to go to like Costa Rica to of verify. <laughs> but even if we did this like on the U.S. soil, like that is like more verified. Yeah, because there's always like what is it? Yeah, and there are laws which can be enforced now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you don't have jurisdiction, you have jurisdiction over them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are. Of course, yeah, yeah, really yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. conditionality and permanent, which is not really been able to be established, uh, which is the case by like force. Yeah, we don't know if they're yeah. going to be cut down in the future. You see new credits now. There's a there's a couple yeah. of things that go hand in hand. Like one of them, I think, uh, which he mentioned about was the the education mm -hmm. part. Yeah, like you need to educate the people. The other thing that I strongly yeah. believe is important is the policy advocacy, like. The regulations for the local government to try and actually be serious about these things. I mean, granted, the developing nations don't have that as a priority, like the Indian part, but countries like Malaysia, for instance, who are one of the biggest farm oil producers, right? Uh, there was a change in the the, the government of the of of Meads back in 2013 or 2014. The, the then incumbent actually went yeah. ahead and changed these regulations where they imposed these draconian. Uh, yeah, yeah, draconian um, penalties and uh, even even made it so very aggressive that the local governments were uh, concerned that if they even chop a wrong tree, what will happen? Because the laws were around like you know if you cut a tree, then I'm going to put you in jail, and it came from the top. So nobody was even like you know like going ahead and chopping any wrong tree. So if these kind of <laughs> things happen, then you know you just yeah. okay okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, these are very curious cases where, like, the, the government from the top started making yeah. these laws. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because farm oil production is a big thing in Malaysia. Each and every uh, piece of land is covered with palm trees. So yeah. They have to do something unique and drastic. No, nothing. All right. So, um, so funny thing. I was in uh, Davos, Switzerland last week during the World Economic Forum, uh, sitting on a panel talking about the carbon markets. Mm -hmm. And here I am today, a week later, talking about the carbon markets in my backyard. The difference was <laughs> my carbon footprint <laughs> last week was off the charts because I took planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> and this week, I literally just drove five minutes from Menlo Park. So I'm going to talk about how we're using technology around um, a carbon registry, a nature-based carbon registry at blockchain laboratories. And we're not just focused on the, the carbon market. Um, we're empowering business and communities to solve 
pressing environmental and societal challenges. And we're doing that using a distributed ledger technology and Web3. And we've built a, a tokenized uh, software as a service um, offer that, that really targets projects around carbon credits, sustainable bonds, ESG use cases. And we're really looking to break down some of the traditional systems and processes that have been pl in place um, that are hindering um, areas around making sure that there is an equitable way in which the these types of markets are supported. We have a, a two-pronged approach. Um, we're building in-house some ventures, including a carbon registry. Um, and we also offer a, a white label for our tokenization solutions. Um, so Nokia-based solutions, uh, they're expected to provide 30% of the pathway to net zero by 2050. Um, and the voluntary market, we've talked about that, right? It is, it is you know, highly criticized, um, you know, whether it's 75 or 95% of projects are not doing what they're saying they're doing. Um, you can look on the flip side because I always look at the positive in everything. You know, the 25 or so projects that are doing what they're saying they're doing, that's actually a quarter of a, a billion um, of carbon dioxide that is that is being um, preserved as, as a result of these types of nature-based projects. Um, but it does have its challenges, right? It is a very manual process. And, and the way in which um, you described the whole end-to-end -end process, there's, there's probably 10 or 15 different steps and it's different organizations and it's like an old factory, right? It's 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 handing over from from the project developer right across to the carbon registry. There's many many steps in which that's happening. No, uh, is that a subset of the total carbon market, or is that the total carbon market? Five point three billion is it's supposed to grow to? Yeah. It's a bit lower, right. from what I would have expected. From trillions or billions, or <laughs> it's like which is in the frontier is uh, has got a one billion dollar commitment. Um, the frontier group, um, so that's why I was expecting. Okay. Um. So I I just want to talk about the U.S. Um, market, right? So the the U.S. forests uh cover eight hundred million acres, and that's about seven point five percent of the world's forests. Um. Over 50% of that of the land in the US is actually owned by private landowners, and they own less than 25 acres of land. So they have a challenge in that they're not really involved in this carbon market today, even though they have forest rich land, it, it's very difficult for them to get involved in this carbon market, it's very costly. And they don't have that, that land size in which project developers are, are even interested. Um, so if I, I just talk about the, the carbon credit tokenization SAS that we have today, um, and you can look at this as um, just, a, just a architecture in terms of, of what we provide. But we've got the, the supply side, which is, you know, these landowners, the forest rich, and the demand side, which are the corporations that are looking to offset their carbon emissions by, by buying credits. Um, we've built out a, a carbon registry called Carbon Land Trust. And then we also have a supporting infrastructure, which is enabling us to white label um, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of use cases um, very quickly. Um, but with, within that, we've all, we've got a way in which we're bringing in the uh, the measurement, reporting, and verification in in terms of a, a workflow. 
Um, we've got the carbon credits. We're able to bring in the certif certificates for of removal. And we offer a, a marketplace as well. Um, and we're bringing in also satellite data um, that's enabling us to, to ensure that measurement. So just the, the couple of, of use cases quickly. The, the um, white label that we have is with a company called Intrinsic Methods, who's a partner of ours. And then we've built out Carbon Land Trust, which is a, a nonprofit uh, carbon registry. Um, so we've talked about we've talked about the current current challenges with the the processes being uh, lengthy and manual. Um, the reforestation and afforestation projects, um, you know, you've got to wait for trees to grow, right? <laughs> and there's no guarantee that those trees are going to survive. Um, intrinsic Methods actually has a patented way in which a root system that is called Root Maker, um, it's a root system in which trees can grow two to three times faster. And there's a higher survivability rate um, for, for those trees in growth. Um, and I, I showed you those stats. Private landowners are, are excluded from this carbon credit opportunity. So within both of uh, both intrinsic method, which is our partner, as well as our own um, homegrown in-house in built carbon land trust, um, we're leveraging a digital MRV, which is adding this layer of automation, um, intelligence and transparency. And then we, we're enabling a more inclusive and accessible way in which these landowners are able to um, join the carbon registry and join the carbon market through a, a zero upfront fees. So when we look at how we bring um, the technology, um, whether that's blockchain or bringing in AI and, and machine learning, the results are accurate measurement, first of all, because you're getting all of that data. Um, you're getting full transparency because you're using um, you're using a, a mechanism from issuance to any trading to any retirement of that credit. You're getting full visibility. It's completely auditable. So from project verification, all of that information is tracked um, throughout um, that blockchain capabilities. And any non-fungible tokens that are minted will include all of the third-party reviews and sign-offs. So we go back to some of the challenges that have happened in the past. Now, these projects are still in, in early pilot stage, um, but these are the results that we're finding. Um, and just to close off, I mean, obviously, we, we're... Um, getting a lot of uh, submissions for government grants for our, our carbon registry. Um, we're in a round of funding right now. So we're looking to raise uh, 3.6 million in this current round in Q1. Um, we've worked with Ripple Labs because our, our blockchain is, uh, is built on um, the XRP ledger, which is one of the first carbon neutral uh, blockchains. Um, our, our first customer uh, is using our license modeling, um, and also we're taking a 3% a transaction fee for every uh, credit that is issued as well. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, thank you for the very innovative thing that you're doing. Uh, you had a slide before wherein in the results it was written NFTs. So NFT minted with included third party reviews and sign off. Could you uh, share a little bit more on that? Yeah, so those those are the uh, the non fungible tokens um, that we would uh, we would mint based on the the offsetting of the carbon. So we would provide it to be a value. So let's say it's a a value of fifteen dollars for for that carbon credit. Uh, we would mint that. We would be able to mint that credit and make that available as part of the certificate that would then be issued for corporations to offset. In how many years is the carbon sequestered? 
The carbon how so like, the different carbon removal methods have different years of like you know how long is the carbon removed from the uh, practice where like 100 years or thousand years so for nature based solution how much is that value um i don't know the answer to that actually I, it's it's not so much the the carbon removal it's it's more in terms of the the, the forestry sizing but in in terms of number of years i don't i don't know the answer to that okay. any other questions all right any questions from the online uh, audience yeah hi can you hear me yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, so my question is on a very generic way. Uh, I wanted to ask whether, uh, what are your thoughts in general about integrating the nature-based solutions uh, with the eco-industrial parks? For instance, if you talk about, uh, you know, the major global manufacturing output, the countries which, like the top five countries, for instance, where you have, uh, you know, highest com emissions coming from China and India. Right. So if you have to, in going forward, uh, integrate nature-based solutions into the policy side of things, which has a connection with the eco-industrial parts, which are also coming up at a rapid scale, what what would be your thoughts on that? How do you int integrate this uh, in a, in, at a policy level? So, so the policy in terms of, of China's emissions? Yeah. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. How well doesn't that get into some of the article six and other mm -hmm. Mercedes that may be more in your <laughs> your camp than mine? <laughs> I, it just opens up a really big Pandora's box. Yeah. Which I don't think <laughs> yeah. uh that I have time for right now. <laughs> I mean it, it's I don't know that we really have a way to like change things right now. Like yeah. we really have to go every step of the way and verify everything. Um, and then when you get into like other jurisdictions where there's like privacy concerns on their side, um, I don't know that we'll ever be able to validate. Mm -hmm. You know, validation is part of the key. Yeah. I, I think the answer is we're going to have to take baby steps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, even though there was a World Economic Forum where <laughs> there were many countries, but uh, and even COP, I mean, COP didn't get the answers. So I, I, I think I think it's going to take some time before we can crack that nut. Sure. Yeah. Small steps make big changes. Yeah. Have to right. go start in that direction. And they will follow. Yeah. Thank you, Taylor. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Do you like the presentation? Yeah. Oh, can we do that after? Yeah. Sorry, I have to hit the traffic in San Francisco. It's getting heavy. We chat. I'll say I wanted to show you the presentation. Okay, today, okay. but I'll get your email. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Okay. How do you take a good picture? Mm -hmm. Just stand there. Everyone is not coming. Yeah. So we're all standing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your. Let me you know. I'll take myself. Yeah. Arsha, uh, thank you. I guess it's time for us to leave since you guys will be enjoying coffee and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, is it time for us to leave? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for. Uh, you somehow had to leave early. That's all. Yeah. That's what. That's why. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess. Uh,
Yeah. I guess we'll just sign off. Okay. Yeah, nice to meet you. Well, thanks for presenting your your work. Hey, Thank you very much. Look okay. forward. Thank you. Wait, it's the end of the okay. Yeah, but that's what I pointed out at tour at the beginning. Like how much time does each one have? Oh, okay. I keep my short. Tell yeah, them, yeah. Tell them that they're not supposed to leave. Yeah, don't leave. Yeah. Don't leave. There's, there's one. Oh. Yeah. Kind of the go. Yeah, they thought that we we going to end this. Yeah, they're ending. That's why they. Yeah, guys. The the presentation's not done. Right. Uh, so the yeah, we're still. You're just the traffic. Yes, you have to leave early because it's traffic. That's going to save for the end. So. <laughs> don't leave. The honest mind is like, not a presentation. It's a pitch an investor pitch so i'll skip the last slide which is like you know uh but i'll talk okay, about my company after Ajay, uh, Varadarajan, we will have young bo do from you know go to present uh with us um, <laughs> and please stay uh till five o'clock at least i mean what am i doing where's my deck um, Sorry, I don't know how to use a uh, oh, MacBook. Oh yeah. The, the word swap. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, my name is Ajay. I'm the CEO founder of this company called GreenSwap. We're an AI platform. And what we do is basically we do this. We do this for every product of the supermarket. We calculate the carbon emissions at a product level. Yeah. Climate score. And this is one of the use cases where they Communicated using a climate score. We actually generate a number, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of product. And that can be converted to a climate score or a rating or whatever. Oh, whatever. You know, this is just like a use case where the supermarket communicates impact per product to consumers. Where was it? Which supermarket? This is actually last week at the CES, Consumer Electronics Show. Oh. We had a booth and I also gave a talk at the CES. This was in our booth. So this is an API that has integrated carbon data into every barcode. We use AI to calculate the impact of usually a supermarket has 50,000 products in a, in, a, in, in a single store. So that's what we do. We're an AI powered data platform for food retailers to track the impact per product, which is basically, if you guys are from this field, it's life cycle assessment. We do LCA, but like we automate it and it happens in a few seconds. And we do it in real time and at scale. And another thing that retailers use as far as just to automate ESG reporting, which one of the, you know, I think audience members spoke about CSRD, actually CSRD, mm -hmm. Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive in Europe, which is law. Also, California has a law that you have to report your scope three emissions, scope mm -hmm. three supply chain emissions. Our mission is to protect this planet. This was taken, this is the first photo taken of Earth, actually, from outside of Earth. Um, so the problem is, the problem we're tackling is that supermarkets, retailers don't have any way of calculating product level impact because they have 50,000 products. Usually a single product's impact takes about six months to calculate and about $5,000. We do it in a few seconds and for a few, like ten, tens of dollars, you know, per product. What's driving this? Why do they have to do this? In, in reality, nobody cares, right? But governments care. So there are regulations that you have to report emissions and therefore companies care now. If it was just left up to companies, they wouldn't do anything, as was the case until five years ago, you know? So EUS, CSRD, and TCFD regulations, investors have this regulation, SFDR. Uh, these are all regulations which require companies. SFDR, please uh, It's an investor, I don't remember. <laughs> Financial Disclosure Regulation, S, I don't remember. 
Um, and these days, more and more consumers are starting to care about what they buy because we're told time and again that, you know what, you have to vote with your dollar. Even the first speaker, she also said, you know, these are the things we can do, right? One of the things that we have a huge impact because of this is our purchasing decisions. And um, a lot of us seem to want to do the right thing. There's no, there's no information though. We have a whole bunch of labels. All of them are on different aspects. You asked about ESG uh, at the beginning. What are the different ESG metrics, right? There are many environmental metrics, many social metrics, many governance metrics. One of the environmental metrics is climate change. The other ones are like water, uh, deforestation, like uh, biodiversity loss, et cetera, et cetera, ocean acidification. And products, what they do today is they say, oh, we're fair trade or we're organic or we're, you know, um, uh, local. They'll just put out one single tag, marketing, but you can't really compare fair trade with organic. How would you compare? One is a social metric, one is an environmental metric. So you can't really tell what's better. So there's no uniform way like price on every product for any consumer to actually choose products based on. We are that, we are that score. So the, the, the score which you use for calculation, is it from IP or you have negative? It's carbon emissions converted to a letter. Mm -hmm. Carbon emissions is a number, right? We calculate that number. So it's still like an environmental indicator because you do not- It's not even out. environmental. Within environmental, there are tons. Yeah. Climate change is one of the environmental ones. Water toxicity is one of them. Ocean acidification is one of them. Deforestation is one of them. We are just climate impact. We're one of the environmental indicators. But we're the most urgent one, carbon emissions. So if know? I'm understanding this correctly, sorry to interrupt. Carbon emissions put on a scale from A to M. Yeah. and segregated on bands let's yeah. say from zero to that rating is not what we do we I mean, calculate the number yeah i mean sure. calculating yeah. and then like yeah. seeing where it falls on that scale that that scale is defined by the supermarket okay. yeah oh, for product that you know. scale that's what i'm saying we don't do the scale like we're just I the see. calculation of the number you know we're not the abcd people we're the number behind the abcd people you know so what can you do with it? You can just automate reporting. You can automate communication. Communication is what you guys saw. Or you can actually reduce. Like when you integrate it with your ERP system, ERP system is like enterprise resource planning system like SAP, which is what companies use to purchase products. You can see which products have a high impact, which ones have a low impact, and not even buy the worst ones. So you can, as a supermarket, choose to sell only decent products or at least not sell the worst products. So if you have like, uh, a product like coffee and you, you you have like space for 50 coffees in your supermarket but 500 coffee companies approach you and ask you please sell our product you know in the supermarket supermarkets now have one more metric to choose based on which is carbon emissions it's a video of this one which explains how the technology and the data actually works i'll skip this so these are so we're apis this is our api and we calculate carbon emissions. And these are different ways in which it's expressed. This one you guys saw before. It's an electronic shelf label. This is a physical shelf label. This is online on an app. This is also on an app where it says, hey, this is your cart. Here are the top three items. You can swap with better options, better alternatives. Mm -hmm. And each one reduces so much impact with a single click of a button, you reduce impact now in your, in your, in your own purchasing. All of this is possible because of this API that we have developed. This is pricing, so I'll give this. This is for investors. This also, I'll give it's a huge market because all the companies have to report emissions at least. Minimum, they have to report emissions, right? Because of the loss. And there's also business value. Sustainable products have a higher profit margin. So if they do choose to communicate it with consumers and nudge them to buy better products, they'll actually make more money. Traction, this is also investor. These are all our part current customers <clears throat> and this is our team actually there are a few more people but this is our core team there are different companies that do carbon accounting today there are companies in fashion this one does it for individual fashion like individual um, pieces of clothing all of these do it for food 
there are only a few that do it at scale, and that's basically these three. Others do it for smaller number of products. Carbon Cloud has done it for Oatly, for example. Oatly has it on their packaging. They have a number. Uh, so if you have like 100 products in your company or 25 products, then you can use one of these software. But if you have 50,000 or half a million products, like the large supermarkets like Walmart or Kroger, then you can use one of us, one of these three. This is like comparing those three with us. <clears throat> so yeah, our whole like um advantage is the scalability. You know, we use we use a ton of machine learning to structure data and harmonize it, to match it with the closest carbon research that's available in the market and then or in in pub, in the public domain and then tweak it. So that all makes it scalable. And uh, the fact that we're an API and can integrate into like ERP systems or POS systems, point of sale systems, or any internal IT system allows us to real time calculate impact. So if a supermarket keeps changing their product inventory, which they do all the time, um, we'll keep calculating the impact live. <laughs> Yeah, why don't we just do questions actually? Because this is an investor pitch. It's not really like a presentation. I one question there. Oh uh, yeah, cool. After cool. Should we start with so Mayanak? Let's start, start with Mayanak. Yeah, I think it's almost done. Is it done? Yeah, it's almost done. Look, that is also what my T-shirt says. Ah, uh, cool. Mayanak, we'll start with you, and then. Hey. We'll yeah, thanks, Ajay. Uh, well, I have a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, I will restrict myself to my preferred questions. I I prioritize on questions. I not, you know, bore you guys with a lot of questions. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you you are calculating scope three emissions, right? Yeah. And do you account for all the fifteen categories of scope three emission? Sixteen, right? Of the uh, EU PEF, you mean product yeah. environmental footprint. EPSA is, uh, there are 15 such categories, but I'm just kind of, uh, I'm not sure what should I say. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to understand here a little hard. Uh, so when you, when you do a scope three analysis for a product, which is, let's say at the user phase of yeah. the life cycle, right? How yeah. do you do, or how do you rather avoid double counting of the producer's uh, GAG emissions? Uh, I'll just play this video, and in the meantime, I'll just um. This video explains all of this. If you want to know how the data works, like how it actually, huh? It's a dot png. Oh, I see. So this is what all the investors are seeing hmm. when they click on the photo. Because <laughs> this one, this one's gonna answer it in two minutes. Yeah. I'll also take two minutes, so I'll let the video do the better job. Sustainability guru at Trader Post. Their mission, to slash half their carbon emissions by 2030. This means Rebecca has to calculate product level impact. Fortunately, she is an expert at gathering supplier data and crunching the numbers. The result, every nine months, a new product impact report is born. Now, she just has to do this for their 50,000 products. Introducing GreenSwap AI. Rebecca's new digital sidekick, GreenSwap AI tackles two main data beams. Firstly, they have dived into a constant stream of new sustainability research, extracting the impact of every step in a product's life cycle. Our sustainability experts approve this data to ensure quality. Secondly, like a meticulous librarian, it harmonizes messy product data from suppliers, filling gaps and validating them manually if need be to ensure reliability. Now, to crack product impact tracking at scale, GreenSwap AI leverages the latest advancements in AI research. Firstly, it decodes the product's ingredient composition by playing mix and match with ingredient weight until they add up to the product's nutrition. Secondly, it acts as a detective, scouring existing climate research to find the closest match for each ingredient and its origin region. And lastly, it identifies the nuances in each product's supply chain and tweaks the baseline CO2 to account for those. We then simply add up the impact of each ingredient, and voila, we have the product's impact. 
and we know that this data can inform important business decisions. So our methodology is audited by a third party against standards like ISO and GHG protocol. The outcome? This isn't just a time saver for Rebecca or the compliance team. It's like giving them a free month of vacation. Equip your buyers with this knowledge and you can achieve your climate goals quicker than ever. And the cherry on top of your climate cake? Mm -hmm. Sustainable products typically have a higher price and margin. So communicating product impacts on the packaging, shelf labels, or receipts, and nudging consumers to shop better actually increases your overall revenue and profit. Talk about a win-win-win. So why wait? Level up your sustainability game with GreenSwap AI today. So Mina, to, to summarize, we actually don't do the LCA. We take existing LCAs that are the closest match and tweak the value, and they don't do double counting because they're peer-reviewed. Yeah, I mean, understandably so, because when you talk about addressing scope three, I mean, you have to travel all the way back and then all the way forward, right? And then if you take a particular product, for instance, the one that you showed, right, whether it's a coffee packet or a chocolate wrapper or something like that, imagine making a chocolate wrapper out of plastic, which is produced essentially from oil and gas, which goes back to the first, uh, you know, the, um, the, the exterior, the extreme end of your upstream, right from from that till like essentially what you call is like yeah. uh you know till till it's completely you know squash or burned incinerated or landfill right so that entire cycle so it's really hard to understand whether such products can be uh you know given in given as a kind of a placeholder i mean it's, it's <laughs> whether it's a placeholder analysis or not it's, it's really confusing i know this uh... It's a good question, but it's been standardized and solved and like it's in the ISO standard now on how to define the scope and the boundaries. I think what, so what he's asking is if you're calculating the impact of a chocolate, if, and if you take, we calculate the impact of like impact at farming, emissions at farming, emissions because of packaging, transportation, processing. He's asking, but the plastic itself needs to be made, right? What about its life cycle? Plastic comes from oil, but then you can also ask, Oh, to, in the process of making it, the machines need to be made. So what about the machines? So where does it actually stop, right? You can keep going in an infinite loop. But that pro that process is called defining scope and boundaries in, in life cycle assessment. It has been defined and standardized like decades ago and it's part of an ISO standard. So it's not like a new problem. It's like a solved problem, Manuk. Well, um, can I can I ask a quick question, if I if I may? In terms of like the scope, for for calculating the score, right? I understand you can't figure out the manufacturing of the 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 machines and whatnot, but to get give a holistic picture for a consumer to say, I have this chocolate bar, for example. I've eaten the chocolate bar. This is the number of omissions that this has caused. And you make a purchase decision based off of that score, but then there still is the wrapper that needs to be accounted for. Is there another scoring system that we can account for? Or is the, is the scope just up until you make that purchase or is it beyond? This I, I'm just wondering from a consumer's perspective, like I get the, the score is kind of saying, this is the score to make this product with this value, this nutrition, your your data set seems great, and I understand you have to have scope, but from but a included. full life cycle, yeah. Sorry, please please continue. Wrapper is included. It is. So, so the, I, we'll go to. We have three questions here. We'll go uh, to that, and then we'll come we, back to this. Okay. Uh, I we have one more presentation of Yang Bu. We will be okay. sending all of you all on the email, and there is a hard stop at five o'clock. Got it. Okay. So we have another presentation apparently. So we'll discuss outside. Outside, yeah. Yeah, I can ask my question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yang Bu, are you around? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Would you like to go ahead and share your presentation? Yeah, I will do that. Just going to... Yeah, we have a hard stop at 5 p.m. Uh, yep, understood. Yep, should go through pretty quickly here. So, um, let's see. Can, can everyone see my screen here? Can you? Yeah, it's it has stopped. There. Okay. It's up now. Can you, can you see it? 
You can restart it. How about now? Can you can you see it? Is up? Yeah, yeah. Now we can see it. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Okay. So yeah, just some lag there. All right. Uh, through this uh, quick uh, intro earlier, so we'll um, dive into some of the um, highlights here. So this is basically the uh, imperative we're laid out, and by the looks of it, it's likely not going to be 2030, but actually 2029, um, if we go with the latest IPC reports about by what time must we have CO2 emissions. So um, really time window is very short for that reason. And then what we are trying to do is figure out now, how are we then able to do it uh, profitably? So there are plenty of clean tech uh, companies in the world, profitable clean tech companies, but often they're very small. They don't have much of a high profile. They don't have much market reach. So where we come in is that um, we scale them on a totally non-exclusive uh, basis, since the goal is uh, not to make any company dominant, but uh, have emissions as quickly and as properly as possible globally by uh, 2030. And namely, the focus is on heavy industry, so coal, oil, gas, steel, and cement, so station resources, for example, state of California, about 90 million tons of CO2 every year are emitted by these uh, heavy industries, uh, including those refineries I mentioned earlier on the East Bay. And um, what uh, most of us, what we could do is uh, we can then um, enable them. So here, this is just a schematic of um, how we then enable these uh, heavy industries to achieve um, zero carbon. We have a flagship um, technology called um, these um, biorefineries, photobioreactors. And what we do is you would then retrofit them. You'd then co-locate them with um, facilities, with any heavy emitting facility. And instead of venting everything out the uh, flue stack, you would then be able to um, convert that into valuable products like biofertilizer that restores soil, fish and animal feed, as well as uh, sucals. So I'm just going to stop sharing here. I'm just going to switch over, quickly show you a couple of um, schematics that uh, really dives further into these um, biorefineries. So um, here, this is uh, just an example of why are we um, doing this? Since right now, the problem with um, emission reductions is it's a cost, it's often compliance cost, and hence why this is such a challenge, say getting these heavy emitters to uh, zero carbon. Whereas with the profitable, say uh, the fish or animal feed and the omega-3 uh, nutraceuticals, it's also uh, vegan for those who are concerned about the ocean health, then uh, it's actually for every ton of CO2 you avoid, you avoid emitting, you're actually uh, profiting that way. So, um, here, I think if um, this um, chain works, lag here. yes, so this is basically uh, what we're setting out to do over the coming um, remainder of uh, this uh, decade. And to show you the idea of um, why this is so uh, imperative, um, this um, actually uh, loads. As most of you realize, we're right now off track to achieve uh, emissions and these emission targets. And because a lot of the infrastructure that we need to transition to clean energy will not be in service, if you start planning today, it will take until the early 2030s at the earliest for that to have an appreciable impact. So what we can do in the remainder of this decade is to see how can we retrofit existing infrastructure so either they emit less carbon or they emit zero carbon or even negative carbon. So that's basically our illustration. And here is uh, just a, a schematic of what one of those uh, biorefineries uh, look like. Uh, this is actually a 3D model 
of a facility by one of our technology partners. So um, we don't develop any tech, we just scale profitable clean tech by one of our partners in Wales, who will soon have this facility operating in a co-location with a um, nickel plant near uh, Port Talbot, near uh, Swansea, uh, for those who are uh, traveling there. So I'll open up to a few uh, questions while I switch over to a final schematic here. So go ahead, um, any questions right now, uh, just fire I away, everyone. All of you all on the email. So all of you all are, I hope in the book, you all have mentioned your email IDs mm -hmm. and uh, you all can exchange notes. You all can individually right. connect and uh, take it forward from there. Yep. Have... And if you can see it now, so this is our last, um, just the last slide here, just got it up. So that's a schematic of how these uh, facilities work. So you're no longer putting any CO2 or other emissions into the atmosphere, but instead using uh, algae to uh, digest that. And, and to give an example of how efficient this could be, one acre of these um, photobioreactors, one acre could convert 30 to 50,000 tons of CO2 every year. So do the math if you want uh, any of the emitters in the East Bay, these petrochemicals, oil refineries to be zero emission, really don't need much more than 100 acres of land per facility, which is rather small given how much the uh, footprint those covers. And um, thank you uh, very much, Harsha, for the um, invitation. And um, then uh, just this being which, uh, couldn't make it in um, person for a related reason to what Mercedes mentioned, that it's not the traffic, but the trains do not run frequent enough. <laughs> Speaking of uh, public transport earlier, but then okay. that's also something I'm happy to discuss with since it's one of my nonprofits working on too for more effective transit. So happy to discuss this and uh, anything else um, adjacent. Thank you so much, Yangbu, for uh, joining virtually. Thank you, Mainak. Thank you, Narayan. Uh, thank you, Prima. Thank you, Heather, for joining um, virtually. And um, I hope it uh, added value. And um, I hope we have your email IDs uh, so we can connect uh, all of you all um, and you all can exchange notes there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there is a meetup group. You can connect with each other in the meetup group. Yeah.